Well, hello, Endow ladies and friends. Simone here, Director of Program Growth, and I'm with Nicole Delaney, who is, welcome, Nicole, <laughs> who is a canon lawyer, very cool, um, in the Diocese of Phoenix. And I've asked her to speak with me today on a very short, I think it's five pages, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Nicole, Orientalium Ecclesiarum, um, which is a document on the relationship between the East and the West, the Eastern and Western churches. So before we get into that, I have to ask you, Nicole, how, what's it like being a canon lawyer? What a cool, what a cool thing to do with your life. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think it's awesome. I love it. And I love any opportunity to talk about it. Um, and yeah, we're going to be talking about Eastern churches, but it's very canonical. Actually, everything in the church is covered by canon law. So um, it's the best because I get to touch on every area of the church all the time in my job. So all of you who have don't know what it is because at first, unfortunately became a, a secret in the church that we even exist, um, but we need lay people studying the law so we can have our priests doing their things in the parishes. So if you're, anybody's ever interested in canon law, I love talking about it and getting people educated in canon law. So it is the best kept secret, but it, it's of the best part of the church, I'd say. Oh, I love that. And how did you discern this call? So I um, went to the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I studied um, business and Catholic studies. And um, it had a kind of a reversion during that experience, but kept moving in the business um, aspect of my of my life because I didn't know what else to do at that point. But the Lord made it very clear after a couple of years um, doing um, very corporate work that um, there was more. So I, I had, funny enough, didn't even hear really about canon law until after I graduated from college. That's how much a secret canon law is. Yeah. Um, but when I heard about it, I was like, that is amazing that we have our own legal system. And that just, it intrigued me. Um, but you have to have a master's or it's equivalent in theology before you can study canon law. So I knew that if I wanted to go that route, I'd have to get the rest of my theology taken care of. And I wanted that formation in my life. So I uh, packed everything up and moved to Rome and studied uh, theology for two years. And basically the first time I um, had a class on an intro level canon law, it was, it was meant to be and the rest is history. I love that. I asked, well, you'd be proud of me. I think when I was a DRE, I had the code of canon law on my desk. <laughs> and I was just going to read one canon a day. And I was getting, you know, because also I was dealing with annulments and things too. So oh, yeah. trying to learn as best I can, but you know what I thought of before recording this podcast, wouldn't it be cool if you did, I'm going to put you on the spot, what if, <laughs> you should be like the father, Mike Smith Bible of the year. You should do <laughs> canon law maybe in two or three years and do a do a daily podcast where you oh. read one pat wouldn't that be cool i'm just gonna it, put it out there I, you know what i would love like i said i love talking about canon law i love people getting exposed to canon law because it's the faith in action really i mean it takes the catechism and the scriptures and the traditions of the church and puts it in the you know when the rubber hits the road uh for the everyday how the church works. Um, so everybody needs to know that it exists. So somebody needs to take up the, the canon a day thing. Uh, I think that would be awesome. I mean, I, I, I nominate you. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also very proud that you're an endowed woman that you've done our doctor's study a doctors, of the have. Church, obviously, you know, canon law doctors of the church pretty fun yeah um, but we're in the middle of re, re, you know by the time this podcast is released we'll be have it revised with our newest doctor of the church saint irenaeus oh, of nice. Rome, which pope francis said is supposed to serve as a spiritual bridge between the east and the west and that is our topic today nice. so when, when i heard your lecture with the institute of catholic theology especially because you gave the armenians a shout out i was like <laughs> hey, uh, this is a great little document, five pages. Why not talk about it? So tell us about this document. Um, what is it all about? Sure. So first of all, um, so it's one of the Second Vatican Council documents. It's particularly, so for those of you who have looked at Second Vatican II documents or any document of the church, we have levels of documents of the church and they all have 
um, meaning, um, you know, something is an apostolic exhortation means one thing. If it's a decree, it's another thing. If it's a constitution, it's another thing. One thing to know about the church, if you haven't figured it out already, we're very intentional. Um, and so if a, if a document is uh, titled something, it means it has a certain weight. And so that's important. So this is a decree and decrees um, mean they're official, they promulgate something or they could be law themselves, but they, they hand on something official. So this is an official, it's not, you know, a fervorino of any kind, or, you know, you should do this. You already know you need to do this. This is a, this is the law. This is how you need to handle it. So it's a very, very legal document. Um, but uh, it definitely, if you pick up, well, maybe I can just do a quick shout out to on more canon law, yes. is um, the code of canons of the Eastern churches. So um, not only do we have a code of canon law for our Latin faithful, we also have a code of canon law for our Eastern faithful. Um, I'm not barred, so to speak, in the Eastern law of the church. There's a whole nother degree for that, but I have to be able to use it, and I do all the time. The um, decree on the Oriental churches is very much a precursor to the Code of Canons for the Eastern churches. It has lots of legal language. As you read through it, you're going to see definitions. This is what a patriarch is. This is what this means. This is what this does. These priests have these faculties, so on and on and on and on and on. So it's very much a legal document establishing some common norms for all the Eastern churches of the Catholic Church. And maybe at some point we can talk too about what does it even mean to be an Eastern church? I was going to say, so the code of canon law as it stands today, the way that it's compiled, what year? I mean, I know the updated version is 1983. Yeah, so for the Latins, it's 1983. For the Easterners, it was written in 1990 and put into effect in 1991. So, oh, around the catechism of the Catholic Church time. Mm -hmm. But then the old code of canon law, that isn't that 19, I'm just pulling dates out of my head. I don't know if they're right. 1917, am I mistaken? Correct. But again, that was only for the Latins. That was only for, okay. So then the Eastern code is really new. I mean, it's- It is. Yeah. So the, we, okay. So backing up uh, historically, and we all know ladies that we move slowly in the church. So we have always had law in the church, whether it was for the Eastern churches, the Latin churches universally or whatever, but a modern code is only the first in the 20th century, but we've always had law. You just had to know where to find it and, and how to grab it and whatever. So it's not like we never had law before these codes. It just right. wasn't so well organized. Right. I love that. Yeah. It's, it was always there somehow. It was there <laughs> in a very, I mean, if anybody's gone to Italy or, you know, it, it you know, it, if it's there and it works and, you know, it was just kind of, yeah. And being a lawyer, you really had to know where to find things. And even now, not all the laws in the church are in the code. And that's yeah. why you still go to canon law school. Um, I, I'll never forget one of the seminarians I was studying with in Rome. He's like, Nicole, why do you want to study canon law? It's just like memorizing the phone book. It's just a bunch of names and numbers. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, buddy. He was a Baslin scholar. So, you know, his head was like up here anyways. <laughs> and so oh, uh, it's not just memorizing names and numbers. There are laws. Like, for example, I always like to remind people that the liturgy is law. The liturgical norms of our church, the rites and all of the, the, the missiles, that's promulgated law. That's not just like, oh, this is the nice thing to do at mass today. You know, so there's a lot of things that are in the church that are covered by the law that might not even be in a code. And that's in particular for Eastern churches. The Eastern Code of Canon Law is, is a lot short, about 200 canons shorter than the, the Latin one because it, uh, I think every other canon, don't quote me on that, says, and please refer to the particular law of the particular Eastern church. So each individual church can promulgate their own laws as well and need to in many occasions. So you have the code of canons for the Eastern churches, but then you have all the promulgated law for the Maronites, the Chaldeans, the Armenians, the Greeks, you know, they have their own bodies of law as well. Yeah. And who are your, who are your canon law touchstones where you're like, okay, who do I refer to when I go, oh, this isn't in the code or it's in some library in Venice or something like, who do you, who do you go, <laughs> who do you go to, to find, yeah. you know, those kind of, yeah. Well, praise God for the internet in this, in this uh, situation, um, because I mean, you know, anybody could go to the Vatican website and find 
anything promulgated by, you know, the universal church has got to be able to be found by those who need to use it. That's just a natural right of any legal community. So go to the Vatican website. Um, we have a lot of commentaries. There's a, you know, a few professors that I'll check in with on occasion, but for the most part, you know, if it's promulgated law, you, you need to have access to it. If it's something that you need to, to so, know. No, I'm going to take a ridiculous tangent. Do you know your Myers-Briggs? <laughs> you know that I've been asked that more than once in my life. Um, well, there's a reason, right? Well, I I'm sure. Um, I cannot. I've done it twice, and it was in college, so I can't. I mean, that's like a a while ago, so I don't know if it's even changed. It's like it was ENFJ, maybe. I can see that. I can see that. But I also wouldn't be surprised if it was an EN, ENT, ENT, because it's a legal mind. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I can't, I never remember. And if, I've been asked that enough that I need to just look at it. You should, because I wouldn't be, it just would satisfy that part of my heart. That's like people, <laughs> people are born who they are. And the like, that's the light you get from talking about the law, it's like so joyful. <laughs> For me to watch. No, it has to be T and I'm just not remembering yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I think as I get older, I get more of an I in there too and less of an E. Okay. So then, cause you know, an I and an INTP and INTJ, I could totally see that. It's just like, here are the, this is the beauty of the categories of the yeah. law of the boxes, yeah. both are very Western. So just like a quick, uh, historical overview for those who are listening, going, what is an Eastern Catholic church, right? What yeah. is yeah, and that leads to so much confusion uh, to a lot of people because um, no offense to you, Simone, but I think most people think you're an Orthodox. <laughs> yes. Have you have you run into that? I gave a whole talk actually using the handout that you gave us at the oh. lecture you gave because you know there are different there are different handouts out there of like the Eastern churches, but yours was so nice and clean, no surprise. But they oh I gave a lecture about Eastern Catholicism and they wow. still at the end of the lecture were like, so you're not Orthodox. So I was like, <laughs> wait, either I'm a terrible lecturer or <laughs> this is just hard to grasp. It is. And um in, in my work, so Phoenix is extremely international, very transient community. People are coming and going all the time. I see this all the time, but um, yeah, so let's just do a little history. So Jesus, you know, is alive and well, and then he's <laughs> not alive. And then he rises. We all know that, right? But then there's the ascension. And he um, commands and sends off his apostles to say to, you know, go out and spread the good news. That's literally how we have our, our churches is we have all of these apostles going to the, all the known world, spreading the good news of the gospel. And we don't have the internet. We don't have television. We don't even have a printing press that we're, you know, spreading the same thing exactly as we go. I mean, it's the same um, deposit of faith but it grows up in different cultures, different languages, different traditions, and that's all loved, willed by the Holy Spirit and desired by the church. So you literally have, you know, right now we have what we've established as 24 churches in the Catholic church. Um, that's developed, of course, over 2000 years, but that's how the start. I mean, it literally starts with the apostles going out to the known world. That's where we get our churches. Um, and so you have like the Thomas, Christ, St. Thomas Christians in India, and you have the Maronites in Lebanon and, you know, they all grow up. And so if you've never been, if you're a Latin uh, Catholic, um, some say Roman, I prefer to say Latin, but- um, Because Roman isn't actually an official term in the church, right? No, well, it's the Roman rite. So it's the Roman rite, but it's not the Roman church. Right, it's the, the Roman Latin church, church is actually in Rome. It's the Latin. Yeah, that's right. one of my pet peeves too. Yeah, and so Roman is really referring to the, almost like the liturgical rite, and, and we can get on that tangent too, is we say Eastern rites. Are you a part of the Eastern rite? Well, that's the quick- Kish way of saying it, but the proper way of saying it is you belong to an Eastern church sui juris. Yeah. And sui juris is not, it's Latin and it is not translatable. It is this, it, it encompasses all that an Eastern church is, which means, yes, the liturgical rite and how they do divine, you know, again, they're different in, difference in terms, divine liturgy. Um, but it's also the hierarchy that they are a part of, who they're under, how they're organized, 
the histories, the language, it, it's an encompassing term. So the best way, and each, even in the more recent Vatican documents, they're really not using the word right anymore. I mean, some of your older ones, they are because they know that that's what people understand, but they're really trying to get, because language matters. And as an attorney, a lawyer, language really matters. Yep. We want to be precise. And a right, R-I-T-E, is really referring to the liturgy. And that doesn't really explain what we're talking about. Okay. So we use uh, sui iuris, or you could just say the Eastern Church if you don't want to say the sui iuris part. Yeah. But anyway, so you have these groups that grow up independently of each other, but still with the Holy Spirit have the same deposit of faith. We're all united under the Holy Father. But then we have different breakoffs. There's an early breakoff in like the fifth century. Don't quote me on that because I didn't look it up to remember. But um, those early ones we call Oriental Orthodox. Yeah. And then we have the big schism in the 11th century, of course, where you get the major break off of most of the of the East. Um, just there's some theological things. There's some hierarchical things. There's obviously the issue with the Holy Father and his primacy. So you have this break of the East. But over time, you have people coming back and coming back under the Holy Father, re reconciling those, those issues. And those are where you get the Eastern Catholic churches. So you, for every, I always like to say, for every Eastern Christian, you're going to have the Catholic counterpart and vice versa. Yeah. Okay. And so if, if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm Greek, well, that's nice. Are you Greek Orthodox or are you Greek Catholic? And there will be a difference. So yeah. that's where you have a difference. There is a big difference between Catholic and Orthodox. Yeah. And the differences that you just mentioned, but in terms of the right, which is referring to the liturgical traditions, mm -hmm. Melkite, Greek Catholic and Greek Orthodox look ex almost identical. hundred percent. And almost identical. Exactly. And um, all Orthodox have valid sacraments. Right. So, um, so when we think of Orthodox, even though there is a difference, it's not like a difference between a Latin Catholic and a Protestant who yeah. would not have valid sacraments. So if you go to a divine liturgy in an Orthodox church, you're going to get, you know, a valid priesthood, valid Eucharist, valid, uh, they call well, we can We have Eucharistic intercommunion under certain conditions. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Sacramental sharing under, exactly. That's the right way to say under certain conditions. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Are you, does your heart, another tangent, does your heart lament, uh, I mean, ha, for me, having a family that's, uh, we have, we have some Latins, but mainly Orthodox and Eastern Catholic, it's very annoying to me and hurt, hurtful that there's this, this thousand year old schism is still going on. Uh, do you think about that? Or are you just too busy with executing <laughs> every day? I mean, do you, is, is there annoyance for you? Cause you, you are part of the Latin church. So it's not as, mm -hmm. you know, I do. And, you know, I, um, also work a lot with the SSPX in my work. And so I see it on that level too. And of course that's not the same as or the Orthodox, but there's still the feeling of separation. Yeah. Um, so I deal with it there. And then the Orthodox I do because when there's even a couple, particularly the Oriental Orthodox, and there's several in this diocese because they, they have a couple churches um, that don't understand that they're not in union, your average lay person, um, their clergy, has to but their lay people for some reason don't and having that conversation with them is very difficult it brings up a lot of emotion um but i even get that with between um latin and eastern catholics because and, and i don't know if this was something you wanted to touch on but it's very important to me so we have um the eastern catholics that worship in the diocese of phoenix many of them worship at our latin churches that's fine. We as Latins, me as a Latin, can worship at any Eastern Catholic Church, and that's fine and dandy and wonderful. And, and I encourage anyone out there who has not been to an Eastern Divine Catholic liturgy to do it. Um, it's beautiful and wonderful, and it shows the great diversity of our universal Catholic Church. And it counts on Sunday. It counts. Of course it does, because we're all Catholic. We're See, all Catholic. and that's one of one of the things about the, just a side note about this, the Second Vatican II document is that it really says over and over again, we, unique dignity. It's not that the Latin churches are up here and then, you know, the Easterners are just right here. It's all the same. We're all Catholic because like I'll say then the tangent I was going to go on is 
um, we have these Eastern Catholics who worship at the Latin church for two reasons. One, it could be that there's not their church in the Valley, like yep. you experienced, yep. or um, there is, but they don't actually realize that's who they are because, you know, a couple generations ago, their families came over from Iraq or Lebanon or wherever they came from. And they just, part of assimilating to the culture was to go to the Latin church there. And there might not have been a church at that time. And they kind of forget who they are. Right. And that saddens me. Yep. That saddens me actually probably more than the Orthodox split, because yeah. when I try to explain to somebody the beauty of who they are, like, isn't this exciting? I'm telling you that you're, you know, this is who you are. And they are offended. Uh, like, they're yeah. offended. And I have my parishes because I preach this and every training I ever do about Eastern Catholics in our diocese because there's such an ignorance about it. Yeah. Um, when the parish ministers catch on and they get it and then they're aware of it and they talk to the people in the pews about it, like RCIA issues or children's catechesis is where it comes up a lot. They really are hurt as if we're telling them that the, they're not Catholic. Catholic. Yeah, right, right. And it, that hurts me probably more than anything because yeah. it's so not true. Right. Um, and that's what I, I hope we could communicate too is there is a beauty to the diversity of the Catholic church. Um, and let's, yeah. yeah. Is that, in, uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, I didn't even think about that because you think that you're trying to reintroduce into their own culture, tradition, like you said, this unique beauty, beauty and diversity. And for them to feel like uh, excluded is like so contrary. You're exactly saying the opposite. Exactly. That yeah. hurt. I mean, I just, I, my heart goes out to them because I, I don't, and, and it's, consistent that response like consistently that response and and I don't know what to do because there are so you can worship at any church catholic church you want to on a weekend that's fine but there are jurisdiction issues and so yeah. let's for say for example in the big one there's two big ones marriage and ordination yeah and so if you want to get married you so going just a quick catechesis on marriage the ministers of the sacrament of marriage is a couple and the priest or deacon in the latin church is the witness of those vows and in order to be that witness you have to have the jurisdiction to do that just like you know like uh you go to maricopa county and you want to get married by the civil magistrate there he has to have jurisdiction to do that it's no different but if you don't have the jurisdiction the marriage is actually invalid right so you have jurisdiction based on who you are and where you are well if you're a latin minister but you neither, neither of the parties getting married are latin there's no jurisdiction there's no relationship there so it's actually an invalid marriage right big deal <laughs> huge deal big deal so, and we can work with that like people are like oh the law is so not pastoral well no this is why we do this there's a couple reasons one um people have the right to get what they think they're getting when in terms of, of, of sacraments and the, the, the ministers have a responsibility to know what they're supposed to be doing and when. Two, the church has always been concerned and continues to be concerned because I wrote to Rome about this a few months, a couple of years ago, is we don't, the church is very protective of these Eastern churches. So yeah. the Latin church is bigger than all the other Eastern churches combined. Yep. And it is, it, there's a risk that these little 23 Eastern churches will disappear if the church doesn't protect them. And they want to protect that history and inherit, inheritance that we have. Right. So that's why, and, and there's good reasons for that. And, you know, I, I wrote to the congregation in Rome, there's a co congregation in Rome just for Oriental churches. And I said, look, this is our issue. You know, we're in the dysphoria, it, it just, right? Did I say that right? Um, and we have all these people here and the several generations have gone by and they've forgotten who they are. Um, can we say that they're Latin for jurisdiction purposes or, you know, just to test yeah. the waters? And their answer was no. No, oh, yeah. I tried to, in my younger days, I tried to become Malkite uh -huh. and... Uh, and <laughs> And the Melkite priest was like, sure, sure, sure. He thought I was a Latin. And oh. I, said, I said, oh, I'm, I'm Ar Armenian. And he was like, oh, okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you stay Armenian, 
stay who you are, stay as you are. And you keep coming to worship here. Cause again, there was no Armenian Catholic church there. You know, I just, that's I got, funny. I got, yeah, but I've, I've come some of my friends that I have a friend who, not to make this all very personal, but I think it's interesting to hear yeah. who the Greek Orthodox, uh, took, had a reversion moment to Jesus. And I think did a profession of faith in the Latin church or just got quote unquote confirmed. I don't know what, you know, cause there's, you know, you know how it is out there. I, do. Um, <laughs> I, I have a valid, but illicit Latin confirmation because my parents were ignorant about what happened in my back. Va- okay. anyway, anyway, whatever. Um, but I said, well, hold on. If you're actually Greek baptized Greek Orthodox, and then you somehow became Latin, you need to go through your Melkite. You're under the Melkite. You're under the Greek Catholic, not the Latin Catholic. And then he he married through permission a Coptic Orthodox woman. So I'm like, wait. I'm like, this is. I was like, you might want to look into this. I have another friend who was one of those fifth century break off Orient. I think Assyrian Orthodox. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And and he became is now a latin i don't know i don't know if there was anything official in a transferring of rights or i, I don't know i don't know probably uh but then got married latin i thought well hold on <laughs> it could his marriage be invalid could their marriage be invalid it depends and you know going back to you said about your confirmation you were probably confirmed at baptism i was i absolutely was chrismated at baptism yeah yeah but, yeah absolutely Absolutely. So that was was silly. It's silly, right? It's silly. But no, a lot of people, Latins don't realize that, that, you know, you need, you need to understand that uh, Eastern Catholics do things differently. And that is a good thing. And we need to keep it that way. And so Eastern Catholics, you receive all three sacraments at the time of baptism, all the sacraments of, uh, of initiation. Now in the United States, some have deferred first communion to the age of reason, but this document, this Second Vatican II document says you need, if you have decided to do things in a Latin way, it doesn't quite say that, but if you have fallen off the wagon in terms of your own traditions, you need to go back to your own traditions, which would be all sacraments. And yes, babies get a little piece of Jesus on his or her tongue, and that's beautiful and wonderful. But yeah, so the jurisdiction issues with marriage, um, you know, we can work through all of that. Um, we can senate things, which is a legal way of fixing invalid jurisdiction issues. Um, but there are like, if you want to get married in a certain way, we can get the faculties and jurisdiction all worked out, but you have to do it. You have to go um, through the process. You just go through the process and you can even switch churches if you want to, but that's also like you were saying, you were trying to become male guide. I think his response is hilarious. Um, but we, you know, we, that's possible, but the church really wants you to just understand and embrace who you are yeah. um, and protect who you are and protect your church. Yeah. And I'm glad he said, no, it was just a, it was a hot flirtation in 2009 <laughs> <laughs> with the Greeks. Then my, I know I have a lot of Malachites in my family, you know, the, the identity crisis of like, you know, Easterners, immigrant children. I'm like, where do I belong? You know? Yes. Um, I mean, it's, it's real. It's real. So it's I think totally real. Part of that whole thing. So why should endow women, lay people in general, why should they read this short, but important document? Why, why should they read it? I think that, first of all, I think your average American Latin Catholic has no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, again, and, and I'm no, no judgment. I mean, like I said, how even our parish staff who work in our parishes don't understand this. So, I mean, how can they pass it on? Right. I think expose yourself to the beauty of the church. Um, and this will give you this again, this is a very legal document. Um, which I love. Um, yeah. So if you're, if you love order and, you know, things like that, go ahead and read this, but with the beauty outside of the legal language, but it's still legal is showing the, the unit unity of the church and all of its parts, you know, Eastern and West that they're all, like I said, um, equal in dignity. It's very, it very much pushes that it encourages, um, the each, each church to retain who they are and get all those things that are not. Um, And then I encourage anyone, if you have not experienced another Catholic church 
to do so. Um, so like I said, look up if, if you're in Phoenix, there's lots. Uh, if you're in a big metropolitan area, if you're, you know, East Coast and West Coast, there's going to be a lot. Um, try to find one um, so that you can experience it as well. You're going to hear different languages. You're going to hear, you're going to, you know, uh, yeah, it, the beauty is, is, is just, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's astounding. I mean, the, the differences in our church, um, we are, I would venture to say the most diverse group of people on the planet because we literally cover the planet. And we, like I said, with that uh, ancient tradition have so much diversity that really everyone needs to experience that. That's awesome. What's your favorite of the Eastern churches? You don't, you don't have to say Armenian. <laughs> okay. Well, I unfortunately have never been to an Armenian uh, divine liturgy oh. mostly because I've never been in a place that had one. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it that's tough. I'm I'm more familiar with the Ruthenians because I are here. Um, my maid of honor is Maronite, so I have experienced some of that. Um, I will say I got to the Chaldean community here. We got in my husband and I got invited to one of their Lenten fish fries. That is so cool. They put a fish on a cross and put it on the fire. It's the coolest thing. Awesome. So, I mean, all these little traditions and histories that's yeah. unique to each group. So I think you're going to find something anywhere that you're going to love. And I know there are people, like I said, that do switch churches because they really felt, feel fed by another um, liturgy and a different, another tradition. And that's wonderful. We have a lot of people because the Byzantine Ruthenian right is so prevalent here church sui yep. um we have a lot of latins who do um change um, but you don't need to just go and enjoy yeah God. yeah yeah worship him um do you think there'll ever be big question uh, a moment where the conditions for eucharistic intercommunion are such as that you don't have to i mean this would depend i think this would depend more on the orthodox end of things but where you could just go worship god in orthodox perish with that because you could go to an armenian liturgy in phoenix but it's armenian orthodox right. but it wouldn't quote unquote count for your sunday obligation because right. because right. it's apostolic not uh or, or orthodox apostolic not armenian catholic right. do you think we'll ever get to a moment where we can just worship yeah. churches i i think um I think a lot would have to happen and I would be a little afraid um, we suffer particularly in our culture from relativism and I wouldn't want that to creep in to um, like ecclesial relativism yeah yeah but, I would fear that yeah and it's it's a, it's upsetting to me because because yes I am educated in the west so I think <laughs> much to the annoyance <laughs> my mother you know <laughs> who's like monophysitism is that even a real heresy is it you know because the <laughs> we have, you know anyway yes. as you know but um i'm like words matter they they words represent meaning and meaning changes based on the word but you're kind of right too it's not like your everyday sunday worshiper is thinking oh this church accepts the first three ecumenical councils right. this church accepts the first seven like the truth is uh doubt doubt that anybody is a formal or material heretic i'm gonna say that but yeah, yeah. um but that being said i you know and john as you know john paul ii is you know endows inspiration touchstone the reason endow is a thing uh and he very much um was passionate about ecumenism without that temptation to fall obviously into relative ecclesial relativism if you will mm -hmm. um so yeah any any thoughts on john paul ii his priorities has the church made progress on this what you know any 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 words about that because his big document is ut unum sin that they may be one from john 17 and he says the church has got to breathe with both lungs right. her eastern and her western lung which is another reason to read you know, this, this is a short document. You could read his longer encyclical and maybe we'll have an endow study on it one day, but any, any thoughts on that before, before we conclude this wonderful conversation? Yeah. You know, I don't have any immediate thoughts. I know I work, another canonist that works with me is from India and in, in those countries where it's so much more prevalent, the, the tension between Catholic and Orthodox, I think you'd really want to ask that question from somebody who lives it there, because I think you, you hit the nail on the head. We have this Western mentality, um, 
that's very, I don't think we see the tension as much as you would see it where it really it hits home. And that is in the Middle East, like I said, India. Um, and I know that the, those are still very real. And so um, I, I, of course, I feel like we haven't, I don't think we've taken any steps back by any stretch of the imagination, but I think to get a real pulse on that question, you'd have to ask somebody who is in the in the midst of it. And I know in talking with my compatriot here, you know, there still is a real uh, tension there between Orthodox and Catholics, at least in India. Um, but I think you'd have to look at each culture to see. And then that's, you know, why we the universal church and we have a congregation in Rome that they would have kind of this pulse going on. But, you know, we have that, uh, we, we hope for that unity with the Orthodox. I, I mentioned the SSPX, again, they're Catholic, but without, um, full canonical jurisdiction would be their status. Um, there's a lot of that uh, kind of going around. And my my heart would say we always want all of them to have that unity. So we have this freedom of going to different uh, liturgies and speaking the same language. And, you know, that tension is, is not what the Lord intends. So it's not. I'm, it, it's interesting with the SSPX that in a similar way to the Orthodox, they've got valid stuff going on, but it's, it's, it's a matter of like authority and hierarchy. Is that correct? So it's yes and no. Um, so uh, the SSPX, I mean, I don't know how much you want to go on this tangent. Uh, so <laughs> a real quick one, because I have two yeah. more tangents before we start. Okay. <laughs> so they are, um, they were our religious order that were founded um, in the 70s with approbation from Rome. So they are a Latin uh, uh, pontifical right order. Um, and then there was an, uh, an excommunication that came with some ordination of some bishops, but that excommunication has been lifted. So you would not say that they're in schism or anything like that, but they don't have, um, like, you know, when a religious order comes to a diocese, they get approbation from that bishop, you know, they don't get that. They don't have the, the jurisdiction and the um, canon, not always the canonical um, jurisdiction that they would need, but they are Catholic. They just, they're like a religious order that's in a diocese kind of without the permission oh, of the bishop. Interesting. I didn't know that. Very fascinating. Thanks for that little tangent. I, th I think back to our our, our previous tangent, I think the reason, another reason why it's interesting and lamentable to me is that I don't, yeah, the situation in India is, is new for me to hear about, but I could at least say in the Middle East, especially during my parents' time, nobody really cares that much except for my Melkai grandmother, right? My Melkai great grandmother. And I'm sure that was there too. Nobody really cares between the Orthodox and Catholic. Mm. They would go to each other's churches and it's like same difference. Similar to before, before Christianity was legalized, because once Christianity was legalized, then you have time to talk theology, is the son equal to the father, you know, get into all these like theological debates, Christological right. debates, which led to all these mm -hmm. early Christological heresies. But before that, when you're in persecution time, nobody's arguing about theology. Christians are united and Christians are worshiping and Christians are trying to stay alive. I think very similarly in my parents' generation, it's like, hey, we have bigger fish to fry, AKA Islamic persecution. Yes. And, and we're pretty united and Orthodox and Catholic, like the way that there's a certain tension here with my generation of immigrant children does not exist in the Middle East. Got it. And, and so for them, it's like, well, what's the big deal? You're going to go Orthodox one weekend. You're going to go Catholic another, like, who cares? Yeah, like we have we have the Eucharist and we're Christians, right? They get right. The Protestants are a different thing. Hold on. <laughs> yes, yes, completely. You know, yeah. so I think that's interesting. And then the other thing is that you know I have a, a friend who converted from Islam to Evangelicalism to Calvinism to Catholicism, right? Oh, wow, and I know, really epic story. And and it was a thin line between the Orthodox or going yeah. Orthodox or Catholic. And then he he became Catholic, but now he's living in a place where. I hate to say it. I don't want to put any Catholic parishes down, but the liturgy is lacking. The community is lacking. The beauty is lacking. The sacredness is lacking. There's an amazing Orthodox parish right down the street from his house. He's like, I'm in no danger of not being Catholic, but boy, wouldn't it be nice to go worship God in a place where I feel like he's being worshiped well. So I think it's those kind of things that seem like 
oh, come on, can, can, can we get it together at least on this? Right, right. Well, I'm, that's very interesting that you said that about the Middle East. I, um, we just had a, um, one of an Oriental Catholic person want approach one of our parishes. And if they would become Catholic, they would become Chaldean Catholic. That's just where the breakaway is. So you right. basically, you return to where the break was. So if you're a Protestant, you, you automatically become Latin. If you're Greek, you automatically become Greek, whatever. So she would have to become Chaldean when she made her profession of faith. And she said, absolutely not. I will not be Chaldean because the, the persecution she felt the Chaldean Catholics put on her Orthodox people in her home country. Ouch. That's so. So, I mean, like I said, that, that was exactly my point. You really have to look at each community, like your family, they're like, they're, we are dying for the faith. Let's all just get together. But then you have others that are just like, nope. You know, like even though she knows that if she becomes Chaldean, she can go worship in any Latin church. She just, but she cannot enter it. Will not. Fascinating, and you can't actually. I mean, it's hard to blame, right? It's hard. It's. I mean, what do you do? I mean, and and I didn't talk to her. The parish person just said we had we tried to explain everything to her, but she's like, no. If I have to be Chaldean, it's off. Wow, and that's where you just pray. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for sharing that story. Very fascinating. This was an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for having it with me. Any last, any last words? Like I said, just if you have never experienced another one of our churches, again, there's 24 Catholic churches, please do so. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and good, good uh, thumbs up on everything that I endow does. It's a great ministry for everyone. Thank you so much.